thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And the... In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothing. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent, unto him, sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for, for this church and for everyone that's here today. God, I pray that you please fill me with your spirit, with your power. Lord, help me to, to use words that would be easy to be understood, dear God. I pray that you please help me to preach the truth and um, that everyone here would be able to learn something and to take something away from the message today, dear God, in a, in a way that they could um, maybe improve on their own lives and to serve you better. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Now, um, in this chapter, I'm actually, I'm actually only going to be focusing on one verse to start with. And that's in verse number 20, where the Bible says, And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Now, all throughout the Bible, you're going to find that names have importance. People's names, there's, there's names of places, there's names of people, and they all have specific meanings. And we see here, Adam called his wife's name Eve, not just because he liked the name Eve or just sounded nice. It says here, because she was the mother of all living. So the name Eve means, you know, mother of all living. That's the meaning behind that name. And what I'm going to preach about today is the importance of the name of Word of Truth Baptist Church. Because this name, Word of Truth, has, has a lot of meaning and a lot of thought was put into this name. And this is going to help define what this church is and who we are going forward. But just a few more examples, I'm going to read off some of this. About, about names and, and, and people's meanings of names. In Gen you don't have to turn there, but Genesis chapter 17, verse 5, the Bible says, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. God changed Abram's name to Abraham because of this reason that he's going to make him the father of many nations. Genesis 17, verse 15, it says, And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, Thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. And um, in Genesis 32, we see the same thing with Jacob. God changed Jacob's name to Israel. It says, And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And even besides the, the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, you know, the name of Jesus Christ also has meaning. In Matthew chapter 1, verse number 21, the Bible says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's why Jesus had a specific name before he was even born. The angel said, look, you're going to call his name Jesus. Amen. His name is going to be Jesus because he's going to save the people from their sins. It says, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call, they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So there we see again the meaning of, of Emmanuel is God with us, another proof that Jesus, the deity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Amen. The word made flesh was, you know, that has a lot of meaning. And that's really, really important meanings too. I mean, think about the name of Eve and the name of Jesus Christ himself, because he's going to save the people from their sins, that name has, has a lot of tremendous meaning. So we're going to go through, first of all, the Baptist part of Word of Truth Baptist Church. Now, we're not just Word of Truth Christian Church or just Word of Truth Church. 
We're a Baptist church. Amen. And the reason why we're a Baptist church is because, you know, because names provide meaning, there's a lot of meaning associated with the, with the name Baptist. Okay, now not all Baptists are the same. We know that. I mean, there, there's, there's, you have different varieties of Baptists. But overall and in general, Baptists believe pretty much the same thing. And what we believe here is that salvation, for one, comes by faith alone. It's not of works as any man should, should boast. Mm -hmm. Salvation is completely by, by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We also believe in the eternal security of the believer. Amen. That once you're saved, you're saved and sealed forever. We receive eternal life. Eternal life is a gift that's given to us and that that salvation lasts forever because it's eternal, because it's everlasting. And another aspect of us being a Baptist, and this is a little bit different variety maybe, is that our church is a, is a King James Bible-believing only Baptist church. We believe that, the, that God has preserved His Word for us today in 2013. As He promised to do. God promised to, to preserve His Word throughout all generations. And we believe that God is fully capable of preserving His Word in any language. God's not bound by just Greek or just Hebrew or Aramaic or whatever it may be. His word is not only available in the original, so to, so to speak, but um, it's available for us today in English. It's available today in Spanish. It's available in many languages. Now the devil has come around and he's tried to attack God's word. As we saw in Genesis chapter 3, yea, hath God said, trying to cause doubt and cast doubt into what God's actually said and God's commandments were. And he tries to twist it a little bit. And he'll take God's word and say, well, you shall not surely die. And you see, that's his attack. He, he'll take the truth and just try to twist it just a little bit. And that's exactly what's going on today with the over 400 different versions of the Bible in English. Right. The devil is out trying to deceive people. So what he does, he'll take God's holy word and he'll twist it. He'll add things. He'll remove things and get, and get you to, to cause doubt because... I'll tell you what, honestly, for most people, what Bible version do you use? I mean, you have so many different choices out there, and I'll tell you what, they do not all say the same thing. Right. They, they, they have, there are very big, very significant differences between those books. You have to study it out for yourself, but you can find many places where there's key doctrinal issues, key verses just removed, changed, altered. It's not, you know, a lot of people try to tell you, oh, you just remove the these and the thous and just try to make it easier to understand. That's a lie. That's false because it's not just, if it was just removing the these and the thous, that wouldn't be nearly as big of a deal. But I'll tell you what, even the these and the thous have a lot of meaning. Yes. 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 These and thous, for those of you that may not know, cur cur currently, excuse me, it's common to just use the word you. We don't typically use the, thou, ye, those types of words, but... They're very important because thee and thou are singular. You're talking to one person. If I just said the word you, you wouldn't know if I'm talking to you, Quinn, or you, everybody that's here. But in, in the King James Version, just with thee and thou, if it says thee or thou, you know you're talking to one specific person. Yeah, right. If it says ye or you, you're talking to a group of people, more than one person. So, I mean, that's just one little tidbit, but it's, it's an important thing that we don't want to just get rid of and, and toss away. I mean, you know, God's Word isn't meant to be a children's book. Right. Yep. I mean, if we can't understand from the, something from the Bible, we shouldn't just try to change it and, and, and dumb it down, so to speak, to make it easier to read. We should get smarter ourselves and try to understand God's Word. And, um, you know, God's Word has a lot of power. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be tampering with it. But anyways, you know, we're an independent Baptist church too as well. So our church is an independent fundamental King James only Baptist church and independent means we're not yoked up or tied up with any particular denomination now the word Baptist the reason why it's in the name it's not because we're part of a convention or we're part of a denomination it's because there's meaning behind that name you know we baptize believers after they're saved just like John the Baptist did and that's that's really where the name comes from but I mean, even today, there's you know amongst Baptists, there's there's a lot of these these attributes are very common amongst Baptists, and that's why we include Baptists in our name, and we're independent because, you know, when you have a denomination, all the devil has to do is to attack that top structure. So you got someone at the top kind of dictating, okay, well, you in order to be in part of this denomination, you have to preach this, you have to say this, you have to do this, and 
as the times change, you see, you get that, you get that top getting attacked, and as people don't like maybe the preaching against the sodomites, the homosexuals, or whatever, I mean, whatever it may be, any sin that starts to become popular, preaching against adultery, uh, fornication, whatever it may be, you attack, the devil attacks that person that's at the top of the domination, he can start saying, okay, look, we don't want you guys preaching on this. Or you have to start allowing, you know, sodomites in your church. You have to just open it up and just, just let any, any type of, of filthy, you know, <laughs> reprobate into your congregation. And they'll, they can make that type of a, of a statement. And if you're part of that denomination, you have to either follow along or hit the road. And I'll tell you what, the, the denomination is, is where that, that money and that paycheck's coming from. Right. And uh, that's a very strong incentive. I mean, all your support, everything's coming through that denomination head. And that's where the, the corruption creeps into many churches. And that's why we like to say independent, where Jesus Christ is the head of this church. Okay? I'm just the under-shepherd. Jesus Christ is the shepherd of this church. He's the one that we go to for all of our doctrine, for all of the truth. Everything that we believe is going to come directly from Him. It's not going to come from any other man. It's not from our sending church. It's not from Pastor Anderson in, in Tempe from Faith Forward Baptist Church. He's not telling us what to do here. The Bible is our sole authority for all, for all of our faith and practice. Everything that comes out of this book is from, it's from the Word of God, from Jesus Christ, and this is what we're going to use to direct this church. Now, let's get into a little bit of Word of Truth. Why is Word of Truth the name of this church? And we're going to go to every single reference. There's five references in the Bible with the exact phrase, Word of Truth. And the first one, you can turn there in 2 Timothy, chapter number 4. And actually, this is not the first reference. <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 4 is a precursor to the first reference. The first reference is in Psalm 119. But turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Because what this church is for, this church is a place for people who are interested in knowing the truth. There's a lot of people out there today, they don't want to know the truth. Right. They just want to hear what they want to hear. They want you, they want to go to a place where someone's going to tickle their ears and tell them, hey, everything you're doing is good. You're a great person. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep it up, and and you know, keep sinning. You know, there's a cold hell. Sin's not that bad, and everything is just fine. Just keep doing what you're doing. There's a lot of people that want to hear that message. Okay, this is not the church for you if, if that's the message you want to hear, because we're going to preach the truth. Now, oftentimes the truth is is great, and and it builds you up and it's edifying, and you know, the love of God is is incredible. His mercy. You know, um, there's, there's so many great attributes that are positive, that, that will make you, uplift you, and will make you feel better. But there's also a lot that are negative. There's a lot of changes that we need to make, and we ought to be making our life continually, day after day after day, to come into conformity with what God wants us to do, to really be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. I mean, He is our model. He is the model of perfection. We are not perfect, yet we ought to strive to. We ought to strive to fit that mold. And in order to do that, that's going to mean making a lot of changes in our life to fit what the Bible says. Now, I'm up here and I'm going to try to preach the entire Word of God, the entire counsel, every single line of this book. That's my goal is to try to preach everything that God has for us, not to just push aside the stuff that, oh, this might make people uncomfortable. Oh, someone might not want to hear this because that's their particular sin. There's lots of things in this Bible that... that can offend, and that do offend many, okay? But this is God's word, this is not my word, and I would not be, it would not be appropriate for me to be pastor of a church, it is not appropriate for any pastor of a church to, to push aside some of the Bible because it might offend people. That's, that is just a shame that it even happens ever, and, and, and those pastors that do that ought to be ashamed of themselves for not sticking up for God's word, because it's not their own opinion, it's not my opinion, this is God's word. And if, and if we can't stand on God's word, what can we stand? God's word is truth. Amen. So this church is a church for those who want to know the truth. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 4. The Bible says in verse number 2, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. That means, look, whether it's popular or not, whether it's in season or not, you need to preach the word. Reprove, rebuke, Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now, reproving and rebuking, I'll tell you what right now, those are not positive words. Reproving is telling someone that they're wrong. <coughs> rebuking, yeah, that's telling someone that they're wrong again. Okay? 
And you might hear a lot of that from this church. But the goal is not just to tell you just to bring you down. That's not the goal. The purpose is not to just say, hey, you're wrong and you should just feel terrible about yourself. No. The whole point, the whole goal is to say, look, you might be wrong in this area. Fix it. That's what God wants you to do. I mean, that's the whole point. It, you know, <laughs> if I had a big, you know, thorn or something sticking out of my neck, or some, some big, you know, like a big screwdriver, just something, just, something just I'm like, man, my, my neck really hurts. Like, I don't know why. I would really hope that someone would say, hey, Brother Dave, look, you have this big, you have this big thorn just sticking in your neck. Let me help you get that out. Instead of just letting me say, oh, yeah, you know what? Everything's just fine. You know, you're good. I don't, I don't know why your neck hurts so much. And that, you know, and it's a silly illustration, but it's kind of what, you know, it's kind of the point of the preaching here is just that we're supposed to, you know, I'm going to try to point out things that may be wrong in your life. And you know what? It may sting to hear those things. But the point is to help you to get better, to improve. God knows what's best for us in our lives. Yeah. He doesn't make his commandments to be, to be some meanie, to be some guy that, oh, you don't want me to have any fun. That's not why God's commandments are here. It's for our benefit. It's for our profit. God, just the same way that I know what's better for my children than they know. I mean, if I just let them make, just do whatever you want, you know, eat whatever you want for dinner. You can, you know, go to bed whenever you want. Wear whatever clothing you want. Just, just, just you have at it. They're not going to be doing what's healthy for them, what's going to be in their best interest overall, and what's the best for them. I mean, if they start just eating junk all the time, they're going to get fat. They're going to get, you know, it's not going to be healthy. They're going to get sick. They're going to have nutritional deficiencies if they just eat and, and do those things that are pleasing to their flesh and that, and that, that feel good to them. The same way with God, He gave us rules and guidelines for us to follow. I mean, not just guidelines, but commandments. Hmm. Yep. For us to follow, and it's for our own benefit. God is our Father. He, he wants us to, to live the best life that we can. And He gave us and said, look, this is how you do it. Obey me. Look, just trust me. Even if you don't understand. If you say, you know what, I don't understand why it is. Why can't, why can't I drink? Or why can't I you know, fornicate or whatever. It feels good. Why can't I do that? You don't have to understand. God said, no, He knows better. He knows more than you do. Just trust His Word. Trust Him that He is a loving Father. He is merciful and He does have what's best for you in, in mind for you. And just, just to believe that. And look here in uh, verse number 3, 2 Timothy chapter 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And I'll tell you what, that's the day we're living in today. People do not want to endure sound doctrine. And after their own lusts, what they want to hear, they heap to themselves teachers, it says, having itching ears. So it's like, yeah, just I got an itch right here. You scratch this. I, I like hearing... Oh, yeah, yeah, that feels really good. Tell me some more about how good I am and, and just, you know, everything's just fine. Tell me some more. You know, it, it reminds me of the, of the prophets of the Old Testament where it said, you know, they would preach peace, peace. The Bible says when there is no peace. They would tell people, hey, everything's just fine. Everything's good. Go back to sleep. Everything's going great. When just over the hill, there's, you know, there's an army coming that's just going to destroy the city and take them all captive and lead them away. They didn't want to preach the truth because, you know what, that's not a pleasant message. Then verse number four, it says, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. A lot of people, they just want to hear lies. They want to hear, hear fables, stories. I'll tell you what, a word of truth, Baptist Church, I promise you I will not be preaching fables. Amen. This is a church that's going to preach the truth. And again, if you're interested in the truth, you're in the right place because that's, that is all we're going to focus on here at this, at this church. That's why Word of Truth is the name of the church. Now, the first reference, go ahead and turn to Psalm number 119. It's right in the middle of your Bible, the book of Psalms. You flip it open right in the middle, Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is a book, or is, a, is a chapter in the book of Psalms. It's all about God's law. It's like the longest, the longest uh, chapter in the entire Bible, Psalm 119. And it's divided into all these different sections of the, of the Hebrew alphabet. And we're going to be looking at verse number 41. Of Psalm 119. 
In verse 41 of Bible reads, Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth. For I have hoped in thy judgments. So shall I keep the law continually forever and ever. And I will walk at liberty. For I seek thy precepts. I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings. And will not be ashamed. And I will delight myself in thy commandments which I have loved. My hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments which I have loved. And I will meditate in thy statutes. <clears throat> now, what aspect I want to take away from this passage, because Psalm 119 is all about the law, and you can even see here in many of these verses, he's about, I will delight myself in thy commandments. We have a love of God's commandments here. For the very reason I was alluding to earlier, is it because God knows what's best for us. I love God's commandments. We ought to meditate His commandments day and night. We should know His commandments. Now, Absolutely, we're saved by grace. We're not saved by, by obeying the law. Amen. We're not saved by following the law. But that doesn't make the law just null and void. It doesn't mean that you should just ignore all the law and don't do according to the law just because we're saved by grace through faith. We, should, we ought to love God's law and love His commandments. And you're going to notice, too, that a majority of the references that we see are going to be tied in with salvation. And that's because God's Word is required to be saved. Yes. Yep. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, and God's word is the truth, right? So um, here in Psalm 119, verse 41, it says, Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. So salvation comes by God's word. And um, that's, that's one of the great things that this church is going to try to accomplish as well, is to bring the word of truth to the lost. Preach the word so that people can get saved. Now, let's go ahead and turn to the, uh, to the second reference in 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. See, first of all here, this is a church where we love God's law. We're going to study God's law. We're going to try to better ourselves. We're going to try to do <coughs> as right as possible as we can. And, and in order to, to do what's right, we need to know what's right. We need to be studying the Bible, learning the Bible, meditating on God's precepts, learning His commandments, and applying them to our lives, and, and just trying to improve ourselves and make ourselves better Christians overall. God's going to use us the most, the, 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 more, the closer we get to Him by obeying His commandments. 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, we're going to start reading verse number 1. The Bible reads, We then, as workers together with Him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. And again, we're workers together with Him. This is a church, I don't want a church of just people that just want to come in, sit around for an hour, and then go home, and then nothing changes and there's no work being done. We're workers. God's called us to work. That's what we were doing out yesterday. We were going out knocking on doors and talking to people. We're trying to reach people. We're doing the work that God has set forth before us. If you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, it's easy to say, hey, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, that's great. What good is that going to do anybody else? I mean, that's great. You're, going, you're saved. You're going to heaven. But how is that going to help anybody else? What kind of love is that for anyone else? I mean, Jesus Christ loved you so much that he came and did all this work. He came and died on the cross to give you this free gift. And just to take that gift and just, cool, I got it. It's mine. And not even worry about anybody else. We need to be workers. We need to bring the gospel to people. We need to bring the gospel to the lost. You receive that gift as a result of someone else preaching the word to you. We ought to, in turn, likewise do the same thing. Look at verse number two. For, the, for he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God. In much patience, in afflictions, in necessities and distresses, in stripes and imprisonments and tumults and labors and watchings and fasting, excuse me, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, 
by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Now, this chapter in, in chapter number 6 is a continuation of chapter number 5 that explains that we're actually ambassadors for Christ. You know, we're his workers. He's sending us forth to preach the gospel. We need to approve ourselves by the word of truth. So you notice in, in, fourth number, in verse number 4 it says, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God. And then it lists a lot of um, conditions, a lot of things that, that can happen to us that will try us. Okay, we need to approve ourselves as in much patience, in afflictions, when people are afflicting you, in necessities, when you have need, in distresses, when things are just going wrong, in stripes, I mean, if you're being beaten, in a, if you're being thrown into prison, in tumults, in you know, labors, and working, watchings, and fasting. So in all of these things, the Bible says we need to be approving ourselves unto God. Because these are things that are going to try to drag you down and it's going to try to get you out of the, out of the Christian walk. It's going to try to pull you away from God. All of these different things. I mean, you're getting beat and getting thrown in prison. All of these things are going to try to keep you away. But we need to approve ourselves as the ministers of God. How do we do that? Verse number seven, by, or verse number six, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness. See, now these are all the attributes that are going to help you to approve yourselves when you're in all those other situations that we just read in the previous verses. By the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. By the word of truth, by God's word, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness, all of these things are going to help us. <clears throat> and, and again, I mean, the reason why we're going to this verse is because it says, by the word of truth. God's word is important. And this is, this is one of the things that's going to help keep us and keep us on the right track and keep us approved as ministers of God. A minister is someone who does work for God and helps other people out and does the work that God has set out for us. We're going to turn to our third, our third reference. In Ephesians chapter number 1. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter number 1. <clears throat> Just a few more pages to the right from where we were in 1 Corinthians. Ephesians chapter number 1. And look at verse number 13. The Bible says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation in whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. I love this reference. This is one of my favorite references of the word of truth because the Bible says right here that the word of truth is the gospel of your salvation. God's word. The word of truth is the gospel. That is what this church is all about. This church is all about preaching the gospel. Okay, that is the, mo the single most important thing in any individual's life is hearing that gospel. Yeah. So you have the opportunity to get saved because that's, I mean, after we pass away, our, our life is but a vapor. The eternity that you spend, the existence that you have, that lasts forever. We need to make the most of the little time that we have here in order to spread the word of truth, to spread the gospel so people can hear that and get saved and receive eternal life. Now, the other reason why I really love this verse is because, I mean... This explains perfectly that once we are saved, we are saved forever. Look at the second part of verse 13. It says, Whom you also that after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. When you get saved, you are sealed. Amen. Now, just like anything else, I mean, if you seal something, you're closing it, you're wrapping it up. It's done. It's a done deal. You seal the deal. God seals the deal with us when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. He says, Here's the Holy Spirit. I'm sealing you. This is a promise in, uh, at the end of the verse with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. When you get saved, you have an inheritance. There is an inheritance in heaven. When we pass away, you're going to, you know, God said, you know, Jesus Christ said that, that um, there's many mansions. God, is, God is, has built mansions and, and they're ready for us and waiting for us. That's an inheritance that's ready for those that are saved. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit. You have an inheritance in heaven until the redemption of the purchased possession. God purchases you. 
You are his possession. When you believe on Jesus Christ, not only does he steal you, he puts his earnest money down on you, on your soul. You are purchased. You belong to God. You belong to him. Now, if you belong to him, he's not going to let you go. You're his. You'll always be his. You're sealed. Unto the praise of his glory. Man, I love, I love that reference. Let's turn to our next reference, fourth reference in 2 Timothy chapter number 2. God's word, the word of truth is what saves you. The word of truth is what's going to seal you. The Holy Spirit's going to seal you when you get saved, and you, you're saved forever. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Second Timothy chapter number 2, verse 15. The Bible reads, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. As a Christian, we all ought to study. It says to show thyself. Again, the word thy, that means you personally. Study to show thyself approved unto God. It is all of our own individual responsibility to study the Bible for ourselves. Amen. Now, we ought to come to church and hear the preaching. You know, there's a lot of things you could learn from the preaching. But ultimately, the most you should be learning is on your own. Study for yourself. You ought to be able to judge what I preach. When I come up here and I preach the Bible, you ought to be thinking there every second. You should be thinking, is what this man is saying the truth? Does this line up with what I've already read in the Bible? I've read the Bible for myself. I know what it says. Is what this man is saying line up? Because ultimately, it doesn't matter what I say. It matters what God says. It matters what this Bible says. Amen. Now, I ought to be up here preaching the truth. And you need to know that for yourself. And that's why I encourage every single person, anyone who comes here, any member of this church, ought to know the Bible for themselves. Because otherwise it's very, very easy to be deceived. Anybody can come along with, you know, the slight of men and just, just any um, cunningly devised fables, the Bible says, to try to entice you away. And even here it says uh, that we ought to, you know, workmen that needeth not to be ashamed. It's a shame to not know the Word of God. It's a shame not to know the Bible. We ought to be workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. You know, a lot of people like to just rip Scripture out of context and just tell you, oh yeah, well, see, look, the Bible says this. I mean, there's so many false religions out there that claim to be Christian that'll say, oh yeah, you know, um, and a good example is escaping me right now, but, you know, you can pull any verse out. I mean, you can prove anything you want by pulling one or two verses out of the Bible completely out of context. And the thing is, okay, if you don't know the Bible, you can be deceived by that. Yeah. You can follow along that logic and say, oh, okay, yeah, well, that's true. I mean, it says so in the Bible. That's why it's so important for you to know the Bible for yourself. Read the Bible daily. That way you can hear this stuff and say, you know what? No, that's not true. I mean, when the Jehovah's Witness come and say that, that hell's not real and that people just disintegrate and it's just over forever, that, that there, is, there is no such thing as eternal torment or eternal punishment, you can turn to so many scriptures in the New Testament that say, look, this is everlasting torture. This is everlasting punishment. This is not something that just here is burned up in an instant. And that's just one example. I mean, people, but they have their verses. They'll have one verse, maybe two, where they can say, see? And usually it's just a lot of logic. Just a lot of reasoning and just saying, well, you know, not very, you know, a lot of them don't have very much Bible. They'll try, to, they'll try to persuade you and say, well, you know, because God is love and because he loves people, well, you know, he's not going to have anyone tortured in hell forever because that's not loving. But see, that's a faulty logic anyways. God is love and God is all loving, but God also is not, God is not only love. Yeah. God is love. It's not all he is. God has many attributes. Yeah. God has wrath. God has love. God is completely balanced. He has both. And to me, it's impossible to even say you're loving if you don't hate evil. I mean, how could you love the good if you don't hate the evil? Right. It's impossible, but... Um, so we see also in here, it says, but shun profane and vain babblings. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is by knowing the word of truth, by knowing what the Bible says. It says, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. The vain babblings is going to get you into sin. 
The one more point here, and then it says, and their word will eat as the canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Now, notice here, 2 Timothy chapter 2, this is, this is the epistle of Paul to Timothy. He's pointing out names here. He's saying, look, Hymenaeus and Philetus. Those are two people that are not, that are, that are, um, it says, who concerning the truth of word, saying that the resurrection is past already, and they're overthrowing the faith of some. These people are false teachers, and Paul's calling them out. Now, we're a truth Baptist church. I'm not going to be afraid to call out names either. And we ought to do that. That's good. You can't just, you know, people need to know, hey, Joel Osteen is a false prophet. I know he's very popular today. I know he hears things, or he'll say things that you might like to hear. And he'll tell you how great your life is. But I'll tell you what, that man is a, is a wicked false prophet. He has a false gospel of salvation, and he is overthrowing the faith of many. Yeah, he's trying to teach that, oh, basically there's many ways to get to heaven. It's not just through Jesus. Hey, people who love God in general, yeah, I believe in a way they're believing on Jesus. These are the things that Joel Osteen says. You can look it up for yourself. And if you don't know where it is, I can give you the references where he says these things where, where salvation is not just through faith and that Muslims will be in heaven and and you know all basically people of all religions will get into heaven and this is this is a movement that's going on and there's a lot of people that's just one name there's many names and we ought not to be afraid to name those names and say hey these people watch out for these people the same way that Paul did right. Paul did it to, when he was talking to Timothy and we're going to do it when I'm preaching from here now it's not going to be just you know I mean obviously we're all sinners so it's not just talking about oh you know, Pastor so and so told a lie or something. You know, it's not. It's not just just. I, I caught him tripping up in some aspect of his life. You know, especially when it's not as major. But I mean, these are people who are who are continually. You know, just they have this false doctrine. It's a, and they're overthrowing the faith. They're saying that the resurrection is already passed. He's talking about the, the the resurrection of our bodies. The the basically the rapture is talking about that that the resurrection of of the just and the unjust. He's saying that these people are preaching that that's already happened. And they're over overthrowing the faith of some. But, um, you know, we're, we're not going to be afraid to call these names. Let's turn to our last reference, the fifth reference, James chapter 1. And this is actually, as I was trying to study and figure out, you know, we're starting a new church. What's this church going to be called? Again, there's so much importance in the name. And I really want this name to, to represent what this church is and what this church is all about. And what this church is going to be. James chapter 1 is where, is where I... Um, this reference is where I found the word of truth. And I'm like, you know what? That's great. And all these references are great. James chapter 1, look at verse number 18. It says, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Again, so many references. The word of truth is tied in with our salvation. This church is all about bringing salvation to the lost. We're all about preaching the word of truth, um, preaching God's word, and sticking true to God's word. Look at verse number 19. It says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Now, we're getting into a lot of attributes here that um, I would hope that we can all endeavor to, to just live our lives according to, to what we're going to read here. And at this church then the people of this church would, would just exemplify what the Bible is saying here, that we need to be swift to hear, so be ready to listen, listen to people, listen to what's going on, listen to what's being said, slow to speak, you know, a fool is known for as much speaking. Take in, filter it, don't just, just spout off your mouth, just everything that pops into your head, you got to keep that filter, because you're going to need to comprehend what's being said and, and to really formulate a good response. Slow to wrath. We don't need to be quick angry. Someone says something wrong, you don't just say, oh, that's wrong, you know, just start flying off the handle. <laughs> slow to speak, slow to, you know, slow to, um, swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. It says, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. We need to get rid, we get the sin out of our life. All the sin, the, the filthiness. God calls, God, God looks at our sin and says, filthy. And if you're filthy, if you go out and you roll around the mud, you're working all day, you're sweating, you get filthy, you're going to go take a shower, you're going to clean yourself off. God wants us to clean ourselves off. He wants us to get the sin. The sin is making us filthy. We need to get that out of our life. It says, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. 
It takes meekness. It takes humility. It takes a humble mind, a humble heart, to be able to, to receive God's word. Because again, a lot of times, I mean, when there's something, you know, there's a lot of things in here you could be like, oh man, that's great. Like areas of your life where, where you're doing just fine. You know, the Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. And it's like, yeah, you know what I'm doing? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's good. I see that. And like, because if it doesn't apply to you really, like if you're doing fine in that aspect of your life, it's, you know, it's not a big deal. But then, but then you come across that section where it's like, oh, yeah, I, um, yeah, I don't like that. I, I, you know, and just kind of push away. If you have a wrong attitude, that's going to drive you away from God. And that's going to drive you further into sin. We need to have a meek and humble spirit. When you see something, if it applies to you, and, and again, I mean, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do. It's really not easy at all. I mean, that's why there's so many people that just, just don't even want to read the Bible and don't want to know what God's Word says, and they want to heap onto themselves teachers having itching ears. Because it's hard. It's, it's hard to make those changes. We, we need to have to, to continue to remind ourselves to have that meekness, have that humble mind, and have that humble attitude. Be ready to hear. Be ready to receive God's word and be ready to make those changes within yourself. And then it says in verse number 22, But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Yes, we ought to be swift to hear, but don't just hear. Be a doer. Make the changes in your life. Make the changes necessary for when you hear God's word to do them. And... You know, in addition, you know, God commands us to, to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. It's another thing that we ought to be a doer. It's one thing to hear God's word. It's another thing to do it. James is exhorting us here to be doers of the word. Don't just sit on your, on your laurels and just, just sit back. Go out and do the work. Verse 23, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way. And straightway forget it, what manner of man he was. And this is important too, because this is this is a great truth. It's easy. You can hear a lot of great things at church. You can hear a lot of great things from other people. You can even hear a lot of the great things from the Bible. And what's saying, if, if you don't put that into action in your life, if you don't add that and, and say and, and actually act on it and be a doer of that word, you're gonna forget that truth, that piece of, of God's word that you even heard. It's just it's a man, he beholds himself, so he sees, okay, yeah, I see this. But then he walks away and just completely forgets about it. And that happens to us. When, when you hear something, a truth from God's word, and you say, man, that's true, and it's maybe something you have to change in your life, if you don't do that change and you just, just continue going on, that's going to just slip right back out of your mind. You're not going to think about that anymore. You're going to forget about it. You're going to be a forgetful hearer. So when you hear something, it's important just, you know what? Decide to make that change today. Make it immediately. Just like the Bible says, you know, even if you're not if you're not saved, and this happens all the time. We go out soul winning. Man, there's so many people. You can preach them the truth. You say, Jesus Christ died for your sins. All you have to do is believe on him. You know, put your faith on Jesus Christ. You can be saved today. You can have it sealed. You can have it set. You can receive eternal life. And a lot of people say, well, I don't know. I want to think about it. <laughs> and it happens a lot. It really does. And then you know what? Because I've talked to some of these people that they'll say that. You go back to them later on. Maybe you talk to them again a month later or a year later, just, just sometime later on. You could be saying the same exact things and it'll be like all new to them again. Yeah. They forget. They're forgetful. Here, and and, and that, could be, that could be applied to unbelievers as well as believers. When you hear something and you hear the truth, act on it right away. Don't put it off. Don't say, well... Yeah, I know that's an area of my life I need to work on, but I'll work on that next week. Because what's going to happen is you're going to forget it. It's, going to, it's not going to be as important as it is right when you hear it, and it's just slowly going to just exit your mind. You're going to be forgetful here. We need to be doers of the word, not a hearer only. It says in verse 25, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. God's going to bless you if, you if you make those changes, if you're a doer of the work. It says, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. I'm going to close on this because I'm sick of people today attacking the word religion. It happens a lot. People will say, oh, I don't have a religion, I have a relationship. 
That's like one of the common phrases these days. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the reason why people say that is because of verse 26. There's a lot of vain religion out there. There's a lot of vain vanity of people who, you know, they call themselves religious, but you know they're not preaching the truth. You know they're living a wicked lifestyle. You know they're hypocrites. And that's why people don't like the word religion. And I can understand that. It says, if any man among you seem to be religious, and brileth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. There's lots of vain religion out there. But you know what? That doesn't make that word religion bad or wrong. Because look at verse 27. It says, this is from, you know, this is God's word. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. So God's telling us, this is pure religion. This is good. This is the religion that you ought to have. Visit the fatherless and widows. That's doing the work. That's going out and visiting people that have nobody. Fatherless. People who have father, no fathers. Widows. People who have no one else in this world. Visit them in their affliction. And don't just do that, but keep yourself unspotted from the world. That's getting the sin out of your life. That's hearing God's word. That's making those changes. Putting that into place in your life. Being the doer of the work. Not just, not just a hearer. We're born again by God's Word. The Word of Truth is going to save you. Just as much as Jesus Christ is what saves you, the Word saves you. Jesus Christ is the Word. Jesus Christ was perfect. God's Word is perfect. They're tied in. I mean, it's, it's an entire sermon completely by itself. I mean, there, there's so much depth in that. But the Word of Truth, I mean, this is, this is something that... that I hope you understand the meaning behind this name and that, that you, can, you can be a part of this church and say, you know what, I like that. I like what this church stands for. I like to hear the truth. I want to be a doer. I don't want to just be here. I want to help. I want to help other people. I want to go. I want to help the fathers and widows. I want to keep myself unspotted from the world. I want to do what's right in God's eyes. And I want to preach the gospel and just, just help other people to get saved and change the course of their eternity forever. And I pray that God's going to fill this church. And I believe He will. I believe God is going to fill this church. It might take some time. Okay, a good church, a solid church, just like anything. Anything you want to do. If you want to do it the right way, it's not the fast way. Right. Everything you do that's worth anything takes time. You want to have this big oak tree in your yard? You can't just go and like <laughs> transplant some big oak tree. They got roots that dig down that have been growing for a really long time. It all starts with a seed. It starts small. It starts very small. This church is starting small. It's going to be very small. But if God's with it, God will build the church. God said, look, it's not up to you. It's not up to me to build the church. It's not up to us to build the church. God's going to build it. It's up to me just to do what he told me to do. Right. It's up to us individually just to do what he has for us. We'll leave building, up the, building the church to God. And it might take years. It might take a really long time. But if it's going to be worth anything, if it's going to be worth doing, we're going to do it right. We're not going to cut corners. I'm not going to bring in a rock band. I'm not going to bring in things that the world wants to hear just to fill up seats in this house. Because right. I don't care if all the seats are empty if I'm doing what's right by God. Amen. Amen. And that's the attitude I hope everybody has. Let's do what's right by God. Let the chips fall where they may. And we're going to do the work. We're going to preach the gospel. We're going to do what God has set out for us to do. And we'll let God build the church. Amen. Let's bow our heads and we're a prayer.